Hello everyone and welcome to Community Bookstore's virtual event series. My name is Camille Meir and I'm on the events team at the bookstore and I'm absolutely thrilled to be welcoming Jessie Kindig here to present her new edited volume, The Verso Book of Feminism, in conversation with Sarah Leonard and Soraya Chamali. While the pandemic has taken a toll across all of our lives, virtual programs like the one you're about to see have become bright spots in our days. And I wanna give a huge thanks to Jesse, Sarah, and Soraya for joining us this evening. So to housekeeping, you should be able to see and hear our presenters, but they cannot hear or see you. So if you have a question, please click on the Q&A button here at the bottom to submit it. We will try to get through as many questions as we can at the end of the program. There's also a chat button down here where I will be posting a link to purchase tonight's book. So please keep an eye out for that and click and buy. A caveat for tonight's event, we're all at the mercy of our home and internet connections and server loads, so please bear with any technical issues that might arise. We'll try to solve them quickly. Uh, we'll be continuing our virtual series all across the fall, so please head over to our website and sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date. One that I want to point out is that next Thursday, we'll be pleased to welcome Jess Bergman, David Reith, and Ethan Tobbs to discuss the newly released NYRB classic, Divorcing, by Susan Tobbs. Registrations for that event are live now, so please check it out on our website. So now a little bit about our panelists and then we'll get started. Jesse Kindig is an editor at Verso Books and her writing has appeared in N Plus One, Art Forum, Jacobin, and the Boston Review. Sarah Leonard is an editor of forthcoming socialist feminist, social, socialist feminist publication Lux. She is a contributing editor to Dissent and The Nation. And Soraya Chamali is the executive director of the Representation Project and the co-founder and director of the Women's Media Center Speech Project. And she's also an award-winning writer and media critic. Panelists, the stage is now yours. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, it's really wonderful to be here with um, my fellow panelists and also with um, all of you who are attending, although I cannot see you, I'm looking forward to the questions and we're all looking forward to getting to be in conversation together. Um, so we're going to be talking about the new Verso Book of Feminism, which I have to show you because it's gorgeous. Um, it is, I have it here too. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, and it has these gorgeous end papers, which are, I believe, from a woodblock of the Satsuma Rebellion in 19th century Japan, and you have some uh, women warriors who are in revolt in this particular woodblock. Um, and so it's a very beautiful book um, and very satisfying to browse through because you get bites of feminist history from all over the world over four millennia, which is quite an editorial accomplishment. And so I wanted to start by kicking it over to Jesse, who is the editor of this rather amazing book. Um, to um, read one of the many selections in this book and sort of give you a flavor of what, what it feels like inside. Um, and then from there, we'll go into a discussion. So Jesse, what are you gonna read? Um, thank you, Sarah and Soraya for being here with me and everyone um, for calling in and also to Camila and Hal at the bookstore. Um, this is really great. I mean, this book was many, many years in the making. So it's really exciting to get to bring it into the world. Um, I think the one that I'm going to start with is a, is a more recent one from 2017. It's from Ni Una Menos, uh, which was a grassroots Argentinian uh, feminist group that organized against femicide uh, and obviously the murder of women and gender violence uh, in Argentina and their campaign uh, spread throughout all the countries of Latin America and eventually all over the world. Um, so for International Women's Day in 2017, several years ago, um, they put out a call for a global women's strike. And this is it. This March 8th, the earth trembles. The women of the world unite and organize a measure of strength and a common cry, international women's strike. We stand, we strike, we organize, and we find ourselves in one another. We enact the world we want to live in. We organize in all places, in our homes, in the streets, in the workplace, in schools, in markets, in neighborhoods. The strength of our movement lies in the links we make with each other. We organize to change everything. And so I want to go from there to um, just following up with you first, Jesse, to ask um, one of the obvious challenges of, of putting together a book that covers so much ground, 
um, is defining feminism, sort of defining what what fits inside the book, what goes along next to each other. Um, you know, this is like the permanent debate within feminism, but um, you, you, you took it on over four centuries. Um, and so I was wondering how you chose to define it for yourself, um, mm. how you made decisions about what to include. Yeah, it's a great question. And I also want to ask Soraya the same question about her book on anger, which is likewise a huge topic. Um, so I'd be curious to know um, what she also has to say. Um, I mean, the book, this book, I should say from the outset, was very much a team project. Um, I led it and did a lot of the research, but there's um, a number of my editorial team, Sophia Javaniti, Charlotte Heltai, Rosie Warren, are all thanked in the book. And so this book wouldn't have been possible without, you know, a whole kind of network um, of feminist activists, scholars, uh, friends, writers, um, poets, etc., um, and all of the contributors who lent us their words. Um, so, you know, the most interesting thing for me, you know, so, okay, let me start here. I was, I was trained as a historian, so this was a project that immediately made no sense to me because feminism as a term really kind of comes into common usage in the 1910s and even ideas of um, what gender is, what women are, are historically contingent and changing uh, over centuries, and you see that in the book, too, um, even the kind of little snippets that you read. Um, and so, you know, how to do a project both that was kind of a historical and something that um, was so fraught, I think, in terms of what, a, what feminism is, who gets to speak on its behalf, um, you know, is this a project of just a particular kind of woman or for a particular kind of woman? Is this just for white middle class women in the West, et cetera, which I don't believe feminism is or has, has ever fully been or ever truly been. Um, but, you know, it was a project that was very challenging. So to answer your question, um, the most interesting thing for me was just to ask everybody as I put it together. Um, I really didn't have an idea going in, you know, my, the, that my co-editors and I knew kind of what a feminism that we wanted to see was. It was a feminism um, that was intersectional, that was multiracial, that was about um, the constriction of sex and that sex and gender put on bodies um, rather than a kind of particular sexual identity. So we knew our feminism was going to include working women, poor women, homeless women, um, people who uh, didn't see themselves as women but were bound by gender uh, and sexuality and reproduction at the same time. Uh, we knew it was definitely not going to be just a Western feminism or just a white feminism. It was going to be women who were thinking about their lives and all their complexity. Um, so we knew that, um, but it was just a kind of archival project. So I remember one meeting I had with um, Hasia Dinar at NYU, who's an excellent historian of Jewish women's history and Jewish American diaspora. Um, and she had me into her office and gave, actually very was very generous, like most people were, and gave me a number of books of Jewish women's history and we had this long conversation about what exactly is feminism how are we going to define it and one of the things that she said um, struck me and it, it struck me so much it's in the introduction which was that feminism is the act of um, trying to define an I and putting it into the world um, and because she's a historian, so much of what she did was kind of pull from the archive and find moments when women were kind of straps, you know, scratch their way into the surface of the world, a world that didn't want to record their words, listen to their words. Um, as I thought about it more and more, to me, the definition really became a kind of twinning of the self to the collective, the realization that yes, I um, am a woman and have been defined in a particular way that is outside of my control and that thus connects me to all these other people who have been so defined. So it's been the kind of work of moving back and forth between what feels so personal, so intimate, sex, bodies, reproduction, mothering, um, and realizing that that also is a kind of collective work. And so the book really moves back and forth between very personal um, kind of recollections, um, and kind of collective, you know, classic statements, manifestos, that kind of thing. Yeah, and I think um, this question of what different feminisms have in common, the sort of collective over time is really interesting. And certainly as you read through the book, you get, um, you are in fact encountering a lot of rage over time. Feminism is oppositional by definition. Um, and I wanted to ask you, Soraya, um, 
for anyone who, who might not know, Soraya has a really brilliant book called Rage Becomes Her, which you can see on Jesse's screen. Um, and it seems like this is, you know, also a book where you took um, an area that was a very broad relevance to feminists, um, but saw that there was something over time and among different communities and contexts of feminists that all needed something or had something to draw from this idea of, of repressed rage and the ways women are not allowed to express rage. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit as to sort of um, the sort of rage that connects different types of feminists in different contexts. Like how does that work as, as, a, as a broad concept that affects all these different communities? Right. You know, I found, um, well, first of all, thank you. It's delightful to have this conversation with you tonight. And I really do cannot say enough good things about this book. Mm -hmm. um, because you can put it down and pick it up and put it down and pick it up and start anywhere. Um, and it's just so provocative. Um, so thank you for that, because it's drifting around in all of the spaces of my house with me. Um, but something you just said really resonated with me and I realized was um, really important to this topic of anger that so often surfaces. Mm -hmm. um, I also had a background training in history and I noticed in this book that there were areas, of course, there were places, particularly when you're looking at colonial uh, eras, where women couldn't speak for themselves and that in fact what you included was commentary on the women. And that's kind of the negative research that we have to do as historians of women and women's movements, mm -hmm. because so often women didn't have the power and the authority and the authorial power to make these um, claims about their world. And the way that I really feel this is so strongly connected to this topic of feminism and anger and need is in the topic of subjectivity, which you just discussed. The interesting thing about anger is that it is a subjective emotion um, that expresses a subjective experience and a subjective need within a collective. It makes demands on the collective. And what's so often the case for women throughout history is that the collective denies us as human beings with meaningful knowledge and needs and um, political motivation. And I think we see this over and over again in this book. Um, it was certainly the case that when I, when I started writing my book, of course, it is, I mean, anger, what, what, are you, what are you supposed to do with this topic, right? And um, you have to draw parameters uh, around what you're going to say in a book. And I really wanted to look at history and philosophy and sociology and psychology, mm -hmm. but mainly I wanted to think about the way other women had thought about anger mm -hmm. and the social constraints around us in using anger for ourselves. Because of course the expectation is that we're allowed to use it on behalf of others, mm -hmm. but we really transgress if we center ourselves in our anger, which is of course that question of subjectivity and the collective. Um, so, th so there was so much overlap in what you said and in the way I, I chose to approach the topic. Yeah, that's great to hear. And you know, I, one thing that I loved so much about your book um, when it first came out and then when I was rereading it before this conversation um, is just the argument that anger is productive, that anger is optimistic, you know, that anger mm -hmm. creates, that, it may, that anger is saying, you know, there is a better world, there is something else that ought to be here. Like anger is a kind of visionary um, emotion in many ways and a kind of visionary politics. Um, and I love that, you know, and, and one of the, my most favorite passages that happened that I found in this book, um, what is, um, this account that again, the woman doesn't speak. She kind of enters the record through other state agents. Um, but, um, did I just cut out? Was that my internet? No. Okay. Um, this, uh, there's an account from Michelle de Cuneo, who was a sailor with Columbus um, to the Americas. And he has this account that's just in his personal log where he is, you know, he describes trying to rape a, a woman that he finds an indigenous woman in the islands. And, you know, she doesn't speak in the text, um, but what he describes her doing is that he says, quote, she didn't want it. 
and so treated me with her fingernails. So, you, you know, the text kind of describes, you know, and he's upset and he's kind of like theorizing about this, but what you have in this moment, you know, and I came across this in historian's accounts, so I came across this as a block quote in like a secondary, in secondary literature, but what speaks so powerfully out of that um, are her actions, um, even through, you know, mediated by like three levels of text in lots and lots of time is that her fingernails, you know, she did not want it and she treated him with her fingernails until he wished he had never begun. You know, and there's something um, that was so powerful to me about being able to kind of find those, in, you know, I was, I, I love the archive. I spent so many like happy Fridays at the Barnard Library um, looking for things, um, but to be able to pull those out and kind of give them new life. And there's a way that as I was putting the book together, because it's about five, it's 500 pieces, I think. And there were even more um, that we didn't put in because we didn't have space. Um, but the women kind of started to talk to each other. Um, throughout the book, you know, and you can kind of see these resonances or these kind of clusters over time that happen. Um, and so a way it felt very much like creating a kind of living, speaking archive uh, in the book itself. And much of it was angry as it ought to be. Mm -hmm. I mean, something I wanted to ask both of you about was um, this idea of creating or preserving um, a usable past for feminists. Um, clearly a big part of this book, uh, of the Verso book, um, is to, uh, you know, I read it and I felt like, wow, someone has collected all these resources for me um, that I need as a feminist right now. And that now I know exist, I can, I can go and read more about them. I can draw strength from the part that's in this book. Um, and I feel like in your book, Sarai, there's also a sort of mm -hmm. uh, unearthing of a, a set of emotions that are not allowed of certain sources um, to, to back that up that, you know, can be useful. The book itself is a resource um, in women currently feminists being able to express rage, think about their rage. Um, and so I was sort of curious, um, when when both of you were writing or maybe when you're reading each other's books um what is your imagined audience like do you think about the uses to which the book is going to be put um you know we're obviously in the moment of me too of feminist strikes um you know so how do you think about your book's audience and how do you think of it as a as a tool almost i want to hear what soraya has <laughs> Um, sometimes I think it should just be thrown at people. Like, <laughs> they're just days. When, <laughs> and that's how I feel. That's not why I wrote it. But I will say that there are times when I'm like, you know what? That guy's never going to read a book like this or like this. Just throw it. Just throw it in that general direction and see what happens, you know? But I, I explicitly wrote it um, for two purposes. One was to give girls and women an intellectual framework that I had to fight to find tooth and nail against my education to get, right? And so we don't tend to want to educate for so many obvious reasons, people about social justice or history or people's history or women's voices or women's oppression. I mean, I remember when my three daughters, they were, in school, maybe seventh and eighth grade, and they they were taught three eternal truths about American history. And um, so I calmly walked in and I was like, well, you know, can we talk about women's oppression in American history as a persistent eternal truth? And the looks I got were just horrified, right? And this wasn't even open. It was not even a conversation that we could have. Um, and it wasn't intersectional and it wasn't honest and it, I think, poorly prepares us for the society we live in. And so I wanted to talk about feminism in a way that was more accessible and take academic ideas that had helped me so much over the course of my life and, and make them as available as possible within a context and framework that everyone can understand human beings, all of us get angry. Like that is the most basic thing I can think about, right? Like it's an emotion. We're not all supposed to use it the same way. We're not all supposed to experience it with the same power, but we all understand that. 
And I realized right away, and I had talked to my agent and my editor and to friends about, do you put the word woman in the title? Right? Like, that's a question. And I, I knew after years and years of writing that men would be a hard audience. Although for me, the second audience was men. It was how many men would ever read a book written by a woman about women, about anger and claiming that it was political? Not a lot, right? But maybe there are some. And I think that's an enduring problem for us as knowledge producers, you know, being respected in that way as having something to contribute, not in a sequestered sort of path, you know, because everything, everything about what we're saying in a separate sphere ideology, which is the one that dominates in our lives, means that all of this stays within the realm of women. And breaking out of that, I think, is super hard. But I was hoping that the book would enable people to find new tools to do that. And it does seem like a, um, a true thing right now that the more powerful any given movement becomes, um, the more visible its resources, you know, when people feel like they have to respond to feminist action or, you know, sort of feminist driven stories in the media, something like Me Too, suddenly people are like, what do I read? <laughs> you yeah. know, they sort of renewed it, you know, they move in relation to each other in this way that gives me hope that people um, who might not before have read a book like this will read it now. Well, hopefully, that really and truly, like we certainly saw it with Black Lives Matter, you know, yeah. we hope people read that and then continue as opposed to saying, you know, I checked off that book. Jesse, what were you thinking? No, I think the, I think that's all right. I mean, and I also want, you know, I want everyone, I want men to read this book. Um, I think, you know, obviously, if feminist politics aren't also for men, then, you know, then I'm not sure what we're doing other than having right. a very lovely lesbian commune, which I'm totally into, but um, I think the world is bigger um, than just that, um, although it should have many of those. I mean, so, but what I mean, um, you know, for me, so we decided to make this book. Um, it was a decision of the Verso Books as a house, um, partially um, because this year is our 50th anniversary year. And uh, we thought, I think quite rightly, that it would be like no better way to mark the 50th anniversary of a radical publisher than to do a kind of landmark book on feminist politics. So to me, it was partially about that, that kind of political project that the house represents. Um, but more than that, um, we decided to make it, um, and I started work on the book kind of in the throes of Me Too. So it was a place where I kind of directed a lot of my own personal rage and anger um, into like this kind of productive project. Um, and for me, maybe this comes from being a historian. Um, so much of that conversation was enraging, felt very raw in many ways. It also I was like, we need a new language to talk about feminism. We clearly have, you know, absolutely no tools to talk about sex, to talk about power, to talk about violence. Um, we need more resources. Um, and the place that I kept going to uh, was history, was to look at the voices of other people that had thought about this. And, you know, the best book um, for me for thinking about um, the Me Too moment um, was Harriet Jacobs' Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl. Um, Harriet Jacobs uh, was enslaved in the American South. Um, she was kind of serially harassed um, by her, um, by the slave owner, by her master, um, or the man that that nominally owned her, um, and he tried to rape her several times. And eventually she, she has children um, with another partner. She eventually escapes, but the only place she can escape to is an attic. And she stays in the crawl space of an attic for seven years and watches her children through a tiny, like inch long hole. Um, but this is the way that she gets free. Like she has to further confine herself in order to get free of the sexual abuse. And she's extraordinary. She eventually makes her way uh, to the North. Um, she is to her great chagrin, 
granted her freedom. It's bought for her by an abolitionist patron rather than um, her winning it for herself um, through the abolition of slavery. And she self-publishes her book because no one will publish it. It's now a black feminist classic. It's extraordinary. But for me to think about what is it to further confine yourself in search of freedom. And I think that's something that all women do, all women have done in this book. So for me, thinking about that, thinking about kind of my move to go to Jacobs, this book made absolute sense, you know, now that it's publishing in what are, you know, obviously dangerous and dark times. Um, to me, it seems to kind of make a, make a case for the importance of history. And I mean that not, it, not because I used to be a history professor, but because I think history is always, always for the present. Um, it is always, in a sense, a kind of record of what might have been. It's a record of the potential that exists. You know, you have in here all kinds of failed projects, right? You have communes that didn't work. You had, you know, arguments for an extreme and amazing kind of queer politics. You have, you know, the Paris Commune is in here. All of these projects that failed sometimes were often were violently repressed, right? Um, you also have, you know, women in, you know, before the common era saying, why can't we look at the stars? Why can't we be astronomers, right? So um, all of history is, is a kind of plea to, it's to go back and read it is to find moments when the world breaks open and things have not yet come to pass. And what I think returning to those moments and that kind of space of potential does for us is to allow us to, again, live in that space and to breathe in that space and have a little bit more breathing room in this world of the pandemic, you know, of the election of Donald Trump or rising fascism in Brazil and Italy here. Um, you know, it allows us that kind of space that I think we desperately need in order to think and organize and take care of each other and do good work. One of the things that speaks to and um, one of the questions that's come in is the role of rage and of these sorts of um, feminist histories um, in imagining a feminist future. Um, and something you're just pointing towards, Jesse, was, um, you know, being able to take ourselves to moments where the future might have been different, um, where we might not be living <laughs> during the rise of fascism in 2020. Um, you know, laugh to keep from crying, but, um, and so I wanted to, to kick that over to you guys, you know, what, what is the role of these tools in um, not just understanding where we're at, but imagining the future? And maybe um, I, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I did, I, I wrote a little bit about this because I found that in, in studying other women's anger and um, studying their vision in that anger, um, it, it really was an act of this, you know, this radical imagination. We, we sometimes talk about a radical imagination, but, and I think that this book really shows that. And what Jesse just described des describes that because to have the hope, because this is why I always say that the feminist anger is extremely hopeful. I mean, we're all exhausted, right? I mean, what a complete disaster we're living through uh, in virtually every way we can think of. And we don't want to sit every day and think it's just going to get worse and worse and worse. And yet, those of us who are activists, we wake up and we keep doing this work. And that's because we have this anger and we have this hope, but it's also because we have the ability, probably now more than ever before in history, to find these communities that share this vision and this hope. And, and I think that's really important to point out because in the, you know, over many years when you have these ideas and you have this anger and you have this vision and you have this hope and you have all of the exhaustion, you kind of have to learn when to step back and let others step forward, when to pass the baton, when to pick up the baton. And that sense of collectiveness and contributing to collective ideas, I mean, that's why books like this are such a good resource. We've all been describing, you said it, Sarah, Jesse, you said it, just having these ideas around us, um, knowing how people were thinking and how we think today and why it really matters, knowing that there are other people listening makes a huge difference in that sense of hopefulness. Um, and, and so, yes, I mean, I think that 
that anger as an articulation of need and vision is important. And I think the distinction for girls and women, and I've had so many people get in touch with me to say that they hadn't thought about this gender division. We attribute sadness to girls and women when they're angry. Mm -hmm. And um, when boys and men are sad, it's much more likely that we attribute rage to them. And that's really unhelpful. It's toxic for everyone. Um, but there is a very notable distinction. Anger implies um, to feel angry, you have to actually believe that you have the right to make demands on people and that you have some control over what's going to happen. And that's not true with sadness. Sadness is a more withdrawn emotion and it's a sort of retract emotion as opposed to an advance emotion. That's the way um, it gets categorized in many studies. And I think that, that to make that distinction and say, okay, I am crying, but in fact, I'm not sad, I'm really enraged. And part of the reason I'm crying is frankly for a lot of women, socialization, right? If you cry, you are fulfilling all kinds of feminized behavior ideals that you were taught to fulfill. And it's not as threatening if you cry and therefore you might achieve your goals more easily in the short term. You might not in the long term, but you might in the short term. And so having the sense that you have the right to be angry as a human being, and that you have a right to reciprocity from your community is really important to making that future change. Yeah, no, I would agree with that wholly. I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I think what anger and rage does um, and do, they mean that there is something there to protect that is worth protecting. Um, and that is, you know, you, per you bodily, um, the people that you love around you, your community, the things that you value, you know? And so I think there's a way that anger is extremely um, definitive uh, in telling you exactly what is important. Um, and I think that, you know, anger also means, and rage means that there is no choice. And we are in this moment where it very much feels like we have no choice. And, and people have often felt like this, right? Um, yes. There's this, and also, I mean, all of these entries are amazing. I could talk about them forever. But there's this account, I believe in the, I'm going to get the date wrong, I'm not going to say it, but there's an account of um, these two girls called the Brave Girls of Bengal. Um, and they enter the record because they're, they're teenagers. They're like under 14. Um, they go into a British magistrate's office uh, in Bengal um, who's been known to rape and harass uh, young women, um, young Native women. And they shoot him. Um, and then they become legends and everyone is terrified. Um, and they kind of, they are anthologized in Bengali feminism as the brave girls of Bengal, right? Um, and this anger is what you do when there is no recourse and you need something to stop, when there is no structure and no one listening to you in order to make it stop, right? Um, and I think, you know, this isn't, this isn't me, this is my other brilliant author um, that I was so proud to publish, uh, Brianne Foz, who did a book with us called Burn It Down, and it's a book of feminist manifestos. It's um, a wonderful book. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I would think you would like it very much. Oh, you blurbed it. Who endorsed it? I, I, I also interviewed her, um, which was a wonderful conversation. Yeah, I mean, she should she should be here also. Um, yeah. You know, and this is her brilliant introduction. So Brianne yeah. says that rage is the bleeding edge of feminism. This is always where the ideas have been. This is always mm -hmm. been productive space. You know, yeah. people like Valerie Solanas will say things like, we're going to have the society for cutting up men. I think Valerie actually meant that. We don't have to mean that, but in that space, right. you know, if you want, but like, I don't, but in the, in that kind of space um, of extreme rage and extreme desire to protect yourself, there is something very real there. And I think we are in this moment where we're all exhausted um, of kind of, you know, caring for kids, of doing our jobs, of watching the news, of trying to just stay sane um, and, and more. Um, and I think what rage can also do is be enervating and invigorating, and there are ways in which I think we should invite it in for all the reasons that Soraya described. I mean, to, to your point, I think one of the interesting things um, we see in this book in terms of imagination is just that however angry we may be currently and however apocalyptic the world may be, um, we actually 
I think at this moment in the US tend to be offered like a pretty narrow array of options for how to respond to things that are unjust. So the array of options is, you know, um, legal recourse, which we know well, it is full of disastrous potholes and incredibly difficult. Um, you know, we're offered, you know, like call your senator, um, like while your senator is voting to like put a rapist on the Supreme Court, um, you know, like peaceful protest, you can march in the street, um, you can carry a sign, you can post on social media. Um, and all of these things, depending on the context, can be really good, can be really important, um, and can be necessary. Um, but if you flip through something like the this book of feminism, it's like, well, <laughs> there are quite a lot of other options. Um, you know, like, you know, Brian's book had uh, Valerie Solanas's option of cutting up men, which might not be like the first thing you go to, but, you know, um, <laughs> there's, um, you know, there is much more confrontation in these books historically. Um, and so I wonder if that's um, one way we can think about using the book is just in, in the literal modes of protest and opposition themselves. Um, you know, what you're describing um, in the case of the Brave Girls of Bengal is, is pretty different than a lot of the types of protests that's encouraged at this particular moment. Um, and I wonder, actually, I'm, I'm sort of curious if in both of your research and um, in, in both history and, and sort of geographically, um, there are instances of, of tactics, actually, um, that you thought were interesting or inspiring or outside of the sort of mainstream political imagination as we have it in the States right now? That is such a good and smart question. Um, there are so many, you know, there's an account, and I, again, my memory is bad, ironically, for a historian. Um, there are accounts of international women's federations. So there were several, um, mostly in the kind of inter interwar period, although we always seem to be at war somewhere in the world. Um, but in the interwar period, where you'd have these international groups of women that would come together through various, um, after the 40s, I guess, anti-fascist, um, before then socialist kind of feminist networks, um, activists from kind of everywhere, and they would come together to put forward ideas on maternal conventions and what actually like a humane kind of maternal law ought to be. And they put forward recommendations that are pretty stunning and I wish that we had now um, in the US and everywhere. Um, so there's that kind of like internationalism and solidarity that you see in the book. There's also a wonderful organization called the Women's International Democratic Federation um, that toured particularly um, to East Asia uh, during the Korean War and did a report on sexual violence and gender violence during the war and brought it back and used it on the floor of the UN to try to say, you know, there's something going on here that should not be going on. Um, this is a war that needs to end. Um, both, you know, both the countries need to bring this to a halt. So there are these kind of amazing examples of international feminist pacifism that you see, which I think is a strategy that um, a number of different activists um, are, are working on now um, in, a, in a number of kind of different capacities in international arenas. So that to me is really interesting. Um, one of the other strategies that you see um, that's less an activist strategy, more a kind of culture work strategy um, is the literary magazine. You know, Sarah and I had talked about this kind of at length, but there um, in the 1910s, uh, which is a huge flowering of feminism really all over the world. Um, the kind of emergence of what's called the new woman who is um, modern, uh, she is emancipated, she believes in free love, she does not believe in marriage or being owned by men through marriage. Um, she advocates for suffrage and for women's rights around the world. Um, and in Japan in particular, a number of places, but in Japan in particular, um, the formation that this took was a feminist magazine called Saito, which means blue stocking. Um, and it was like a literary and cultural and political magazine. They published manifestos, they published arguments on what was then called the woman question 
fiction. They also published short stories. They published plays. Um, and they really served as a network um, of female activists, feminist labor activists um, all over Japan. Um, so it was much more than a magazine, um, but a kind of node of activism and struggle uh, in a way that, you know, when you read their short stories now, they're novellas um, in a way that I think does that kind of personal to the collective work that we started out talking about, right? Where you can kind of read a story, identify with it, and see in these characters' lives and in their kind of interior struggles um, a larger political problem that then the rest of the magazine is trying to extrapolate. So, you know, I don't know that these are necessarily new. Um, you know, there's also examples of, you know, women going to the desert and becoming, you know, religious martyrs or turning to witchcraft. And these are all, you know, excellent things to do. That's your thing. Um, but I mean, I think the multiplicity of tactics really to me is what's exciting rather than like one perfect feminist tactic. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think that there's um, just endless, endless creativity happening all the time. And, you know, to, I want to go back, though, to, to the violence, right? Mm -hmm. there, there's never been a shortage of women who are physically violent, ever. Like, I, I, I think, though, that all of our ideas about femininity, particularly in the United States, white femininity, fragile femininity, vulnerable Victorian femininity, right? Like it's just so horrifying to think of Valerie Solana saying these things and then acting on them, right? And we tend to like, I think, in our culture, the idea of vigilante violence. And we see, we see characters all the time in our media, but in fact, we don't like it when women do this. We don't like it when they defend themselves against abusers, when they kill rapists, when they castrate straight men. I mean, we know that when women do these things in self-defense even, like it, even within the legal context that you're talking about, they are punished for doing it, right? So, so I wanna put aside the violence for, for a minute because in fact, I think it's always been there. As a matter of fact, I think one of my um, favorite entries in this book is the description of the um, women warriors. I didn't know that that is why the Amazon is called the Amazon, by the way. I don't want to give away too much, but my God, so cool, right? And so I'm, I'm just like walking around reading this out loud over and over and over again, you know? But I, I just think that's always been the case. And we have to, this part of dismantling this binary idea of um, peace and violence, women and men, all, all of these things. But I do think we have this efflorescence right now of a global sensibility that technology has enabled because it's impossible virtually anywhere now to isolate a girl or a woman or a small group of agitated girls and women in the way that it was even 30 years ago, you know? I, I, I'm part of several international coalitions of activists or um, people who are just trying to do the same work, sort of at the intersection of fighting violence against women, technology, culture change, um, and, and how, we, how we strategize and organize across borders to create a baseline of language and understanding and strategy, right? Like, what do we do in schools and what do we do with the law and what do we do in the culture? And technology has really made that possible, even though we understand the really hideous downsides of the technology and the disproportionate impact that it has on the most vulnerable people, I think. Um, but again, I, I really do think this multiplicity of tactics um, and just the, the creativity that we see online, you know, I love TikTok. I love the fact mm -hmm. that, you know, girls and boys on TikTok are doing and saying things that somehow through osmosis, because they're not getting it in school, they're learning. I mean, they're, they're talking about feminism day in and day out, even if they're not using the word feminism. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I also think, you know, one of the kind of, um, the things about thinking violence together with feminism, you know, violence is one of the terms, you know, Soraya, I know you're so familiar with this, like anger that is kind of like everywhere and nowhere, like it's so big, yeah. it's invoked all of the time, you know, mm -hmm. especially around violence. Um, you know, we've seen this in the conversation on racism where it's like, oh, yeah. Black Lives Matter is racist, you know, this kind of thing that is absolutely not seeing structural violence, you know, and so I, one of the things that I think in regards to, to thinking violence and thinking violence with, um, 
you know, feminist thinking or thinking violence alongside anti-racist thinking or black feminist thinking, um, women of color feminist thinking, queer thinking, um, is just that violence is always something that's structurally defined. It's always contextual, right? So like there are tons of women that are violent. Um, there are tons of women that are violent in what I consider terrible ways, you know, like women are part of lynch mobs, like women, there's like whole women's white supremacy groups active now in the United States, you know, like women don't, you know, there's a strain of feminism, I think, that believes that women are, that is an essentialist strain, um, you know, the belief that women kind of biologically, because they have the capacity to be mothers, mostly, um, that they are somehow more peaceful. Um, and I don't see that that's borne out at all in the historical record. I see no, that right. that is something that, you know, is all social, is all cultural, is all politically made, right? So you see, you know, there's also, there's, there's many men in this book. There are people that are neither women nor men by their own account in this book, right? You know, Frederick Douglass saying, I am proud to be a woman's rights man. Um, you know, um, so I think the question, you know, when we're thinking about violence and we're thinking about um, how it's used, um, to me, it seems most um, most useful the way that you've also approached anger, um, Soraya, to think about, you know, how it's used, how it's seen, um, who it's benefiting, uh, and who it's not. And so I think when we're talking about feminist rage and feminist violence, like the Brave Girls of Bengal, um, it's not about, you know, inciting violence on county magistrates, but saying here's an, here's an instance in which this, these people are being colonized, they are being subjected to torture, there is no recourse, um, and this is what, you know, this is the expression that they have to take in self-defense. Um, and so I think that that, you know, having that, having that kind of framework for thinking about violence, rage, anger, um, is incredibly important rather than just violence to court. Um, I was a historian of violence, so I'm sorry to talk at Oh, like really? That. Oh, that's endlessly. <laughs> Well, you know, it's interesting too, because I think often about um, the fact that I also think girls and women, feminine identifying people, um, are socialized to de-escalate. Mm -hmm. That's right. De-escalate anger, de-escalate violence. We see it even among women in policing, right? Mm -hmm. Women in policing, regardless of how you feel about the institution of policing, right. in fact, are far less likely to escalate situations into violent flashpoints where people are killed. Um, and so I think that among the creative responses that we see in the world today is a kind of collective mode of de-escalating. I don't know how to, to put it um, in better terms, but if you think about the women's marches in the wake of the 2016 election, millions and millions and millions of people and no violence in those marches, right? There was like a collective will to keep those marches uh, stable and peaceful and to have an ethos to them. I don't think anybody ever articulated it. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't like we will all be peaceful and not throw, throw rocks at people we don't like. It was not, you know, it they, they just happened as a, I think, a response to what I would categorize as a moment of violence, systemic violence, right? We, we could all recognize, we could see what was happening in slow motion. Um, and and I would I would love to actually hear your thoughts about this because the other thing I was thinking in terms of our conversation and history is so much of um, the oppression that people experience is slow violence, right? Mm -hmm. This term slow violence that's um, I, I think you know it's it's often used in terms of environmental racism and um, injustice, but we have this this mech this this mechanism in the society that works um, steadily and slowly and constantly as an erosion on people in their lives. And we don't, I don't think necessarily recognize the movements against that as feminist movements, even though climate change movements, environmental movements, worker movements, those are being led by women all over the world, you know, and they're being led by women who are articulating deep feminist sensibilities about their future vision for the world and in anger fighting forms of violence that go unrecognized by institutions and politicians. I think that's absolutely right, you know, and I love that you brought up slow violence. Um, that's, you know, that's a kind of perfect phrase for long term, you know, environmental destruction that impacts different communities unequally. Um, and I think for any kind of long term 
um, structural violence, right? You know, and right. while you were talking, um, I was thinking, you know, one of the things that to me has been most inspiring and during the pandemic has actually felt like it's given me New York City back, the city that I love and live in. It's given me the world back um, and not just me, but it's just been such an, an, an inspiration is the re reemergence of the Black Lives Matter protests over the summer. And so, you know, in New York, and those were violent protests, you know, much more violent in places like Portland and Georgia, you know, and mm -hmm. everywhere else um, than they were in New York. But in New York, you know, you're also, um, there are protests filled with rage. People are, you know, people are crying because they're so angry as they ought to be. There are protests of rage that are built by rage, um, which means you're breaking through a police line to get into Manhattan and you're going through a bridge. There were also, um, you know, protests that were not afraid to be violent in a very kind of France Fanonian sense, like in a very yes. kind of um, self-defense way. And I think that that was incredibly important um, for the movement. That hasn't been a debate as much as it has been in the environmental movement or the feminist movement, which in many ways kind of rely on, on these languages of pacifism that in, in some instances do, and in some instances I think don't take up the question of slow violence and what do we even consider violence to be. Yes. Um, but it, in Black Lives Matter, people were willing to uh, defend here the encampment at City Hall that lasted for two weeks. Um, many of us were down there. You know, I was down there serving food, um, and helping to set up the library. Um, you know, and that was an encampment that, at a certain point, was being invaded by lines of police every night to push us out of a space that is nominally actually city property. It's a mm -hmm. city park. It used to actually be um, the settlements. Um, the settlement of the city, the settlement of New Amsterdam's uh, commons, public pasturing ground, and is now where the African burial ground is for people that were enslaved. You know, so it's this incredibly rich, productive site. You know, and people, I, I was never there during the kind of police lines at night. I'm too old or too unbrave or whatever, but I would go in the morning um, to help clean up. And I'd be like sorting through you know, the, like the food detritus, like the tampons and the masks and things that, you know, we had like thousands of dollars of supplies and like all the old sleeping bags. And I'd pull out, you know, these like plywood shields and these face masks and these things that you could tell activists had like constructed to be able to hold the line for the camp. Um, and so all of this is to say um, that that was a movement where I think more viscerally than I've maybe ever felt it in my life, that kind of collective, that, that self-defense came as a kind of collective love, I guess, mm -hmm. if I'm trying to find a phrase to say it. Um, and that that to me, and that there was a willingness to use force uh, in order to defend um, ourselves and our lives and what we were trying to build and this kind of new world that was being birthed, if only briefly, uh, in the occupation. And to me, that as a tactic is incredibly important. And I think it's no surprise that uh, feminism, queer politics, women of color feminism, trans politics have been at the heart of Black Lives Matter to its eternal and immense credit as a movement, as a set of leadership, as a generation. Um, I think it's no surprise that we're seeing those kinds of tactics very much framed around collective care rather than like, here we are with guns. It's like, no, this is what right. it's for. Right. Yeah, it's, um, it has this clear feminist flavor to it that when people talk about defunding the police, the conversation is obviously around, um, you know, what that money goes towards instead. And all of those things are things that, um, involve caring for a community and it's 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 almost too obvious to to discuss that like of course to reduce the pain of a community you put the resources into care um but it's a it's also a very feminist approach to a problem and it it's in a world where you know like every form of public welfare has been reduced and all of that burden falls disproportionately on on women um, that a women-led movement would say, let's put the money back there, you know, is very powerful and very, very much, much in feminist tradition. Um, I wanted to make sure we only have six minutes left. Um, we've sort of been incorporating questions a bit as we go, but um, we have a question um, which is about um, 
um, how feminist discourse in the states remains blind to global realities for women um, and defied feminism on white and Western terms. And it seems like this is an especially essential question um, during the pandemic, actually, where we're thinking a lot about um, the effects of global inequality on dealing with what is a global crisis. Um, and so I wondered if either of you would like to pick up on that question. And we have a few minutes, but I, I really like it as a place to end because it's opening out. It's sort of pointing to how big the question is. Um, yeah, no, I think that's a fantastic question, and it's one that I think has, has often been raised in feminism, um, in American feminism, you know, which very much does have a kind of strain of it um, that is imperial, that limits its, you know, that limits the franchise to white women. Um, I guess one of the things that I would say um, as a historian is that feminism, as I understand it, and as we've been discussing it here, has never ever been the province of white women or even pushed by white women as much as it's been pushed by women who are enslaved by indigenous women. Um, you know, there's a really wonderful, um, amazing uh, abolitionist poet, um, black poet, Francis Ellen Watkins Harper, um, who gave a speech in, I believe, 1878, um, in which she says, we are all bound up together. We are one great bundle of humanity. But what she means by that is not this kind of like kumbaya, like, oh, we're all together. You know, we're not really mad that you enslaved us for so long. Um, she then goes on to say, you white women speak of rights. I speak of wrongs. And she insists on, um, feminist discourse, any discussion of suffrage, any discussion of what freedom and emancipation means, also take into account, and not just also, but fundamentally start from a place uh, of enslaved women's lives. And so to me, um, her example and many, many others that I could point to in this book are really what I think American feminist discourse ought to be in many ways, um, in ways I think um, that aren't seen as much has been. Um, I think that there's a kind of mainstream liberal feminism that, you know, you see when, you know, Taylor Swift says she's a feminist and that's great and whatever. Um, but when we actually look at the politics of radical groups that are organizing or women that are organizing, you know, like across 20 ethnicities in a factory in Lowell, um, as immigrants and non-citizens that, um, you know, we're seeing a feminism of the multiple. And so I think that's another um, thing that, that an attention to history um, can, actually, can actually bring us. So I hope that doesn't sound like I'm ducking the question. Absolutely, feminism has to be global. It has to be multiracial, or to me, it's not feminism. Like, let me say that very clearly. But I think American feminism, um, there are whole traditions that we have yet to kind of, to, to uncover. Um, and to reclaim. So to me, that's, that's very much what the book is, is engaged in. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree. I, I think that there are all kinds of questions, right? I mean, the fight against white supremacy is a global, a global fight. Uh, you, you can't fight white supremacy country in, within a country, particularly a country like the United States. But I, I often get this question about sort of, I'll go out on a limb here. I don't think any of us are lean in feminists, right? So. Um, but I often get this question about cap, cap, can you have a feminist capitalist country? I don't think so. Can you actually have nation states that are feminist? I personally don't think so. Like the whole idea of a nation state is fundamentally contrary to my personal kind of ideals of feminism, right? And so when you start to just scratch the surface, um, I think there's no way around, as Jesse said, the, 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 the global nature of the problems that we are dealing with. And I mean, I grew up in a British colony. I remember independence, right? And, and what we don't have in the United States is, is a sense of our settler colonialism, yeah. right? Indigenous people do, and a lot of scholars do, but the language of fighting settler colonialism is not a mainstream language in the United States. It's more so now um, than before, and it's more so, I would say, in places even like Australia and Canada. Um, and it's interesting to see how that's shifting around the world. The other thing I would say, too, that I find interesting is that post-Holocaust feminist studies, 
and anti-colonialism. I mean, you, you mentioned um, Franz Fanon. Those two things happen together. They're like a dance that have been happening for the last 60 years, you know, and understanding the relationship between totalitarianism and the Holocaust and colonialism is really central. Talk about the abiding sort of impact of history on what's happening right now. But for us to be to understand why fighting settler colonialism, colonialism, white supremacy is all part of feminist movements in the United States is really an essential next step. You know, there's nothing, I mean, we have to be doing the work at local levels and regional levels and national levels and international levels, transnational levels, which is again, I'll go back to Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter leapt the bounds of the United States quickly and and rapidly as it should have. And it resonated so much around the world. And um, I still would argue that that is just a, at its core, this, you know, it is a black queer feminist movement that is, ra it's, it's revolutionized the way people understand things. Um, so that's, that's what, I love that question. I'm so happy someone asked it. Yeah, me too. You know, and one thing I would say that was a, a joy for me in making this book is that you actually get to see those movements, right? Like all ideas move around the globe. The ones I wish didn't move around the globe just as much as the ones that I wish do, right? Um, but one of the things, you know, um, you see, I started to see these women who are acting in different parts of the world. So um, there are women in the Dutch West Indies who there's a called the Queens of the Fire Burn, brilliantly, in the Caribbean, um, who are burning down the former slave owners' banks and jails uh, and saying you're not going to even have the sharecropping kind of false slavery. So they're the Queens of the Fire Burn. They're still celebrated uh, in the Virgin Islands. And then at the same time, like within three years, I think, um, you have the women of the Paris Commune um, kind of arguing, which is this moment in which um, the citizens of Paris took over the city, start a socialist communist uh, commune um, led in many places by women and a woman burning down police stations called the Petroluz. They didn't, there isn't actually accounts of women doing this, but it became the kind of figure that stopped the French imagination after this. Um, so you have these women in wholly different places of the world, not talking to each other, um, but acting in the same way and in many and what they're doing is bringing down slavery and its attendant regimes. Um, what they're doing is trying to put forward a kind of communist ideal for all of Europe and all of the world, and they do. And so there's this way that when you think about feminism as global, you see that women really are making the world. You cannot track modernity. You can't track the decolonial without looking uh, at feminism. And so, yeah, the global is, the global is essential to this. And I think that's a very good place to leave off. Um, I want to thank um, Soraya and Jesse. Um, it was an honor to, to moderate. Um, and I do hope everyone will pick up the book. It's incredible. Um, you know, foist it on your younger siblings for the holidays, get them started young. Um, and really, um, you know, this obviously was to launch this gorgeous new book. I would also encourage anyone who hasn't to pick up Soraya's book, which is incredible. Um, and so it's been a pleasure to be here. I will turn it back over to, uh, to Community Bookstore. Um, and thank, thank you so much, Sarah. This was such a wonderful event. Thank you, Jesse and Soraya as well. It was just a wonderful discussion in a panel. And I'm so excited to have the Versa Book of Feminism on my bookshelf, and I really hope the attendees purchase a copy as well. Thank you to the attendees as well for attending tonight. Um, and I'll close out. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you again. Good night, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you.